Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through three setting slash adventure books for old school D&D games. The first one I'm going to be going through is Tales of the Wolfguard. The second I'm going to be going through is Asylum issue number one, which is the Spike of Dosku. And then Black Marsh, a setting supplement compatible with swords and wizardry. These are all really cool. They're, they're setting books... Well, I would say this. The first and the third are primarily setting books. The second one, Asylum, has a setting that it's implied and it kind of gets into it a little bit, but it is primarily an introductory adventure for DCC, a funnel, and, uh, and sort of an introduction into that particular world. So it's very specific with the tone of the world, which is why I think of it as a setting book too, because it has a, information about the world and new races for that world and stuff like that. Um, but the introductory, introductory adventure is, is for that world. So... I'll go through all three. I think these are great products, each of them in their own way. They're very different in terms of the tone that they're putting forward, the, the artwork styles, the, the vibe, and the, they're all for different systems. All old school, but all for different systems. The first, this Tales of the Wolf Guard, is for old school essentials. Uh, the Spike of Dosku is for DCC, as I said, and then Black Marsh is for swords and wizardry. So, uh, you know, all specific, but they're all I mean, old school, so they're easy enough to adjust to your game of choice. Now, when it comes to the setting of these, though, that's kind of what you're doing. These, these books aren't necessarily going to be easy to adjust to your setting. They might be easy to adjust to your world, but there are a lot of assumptions in each of these books about the kind of world you're entering into, the, the races, the cultures, the religions, um, the kinds of magic that you're going to be dealing with. And so they're specific in that way. But they're great for ideas. They're great to run straight up. So I thought I might try to go through each of them. Uh, now, it's also worth noting that this one, the, the Tales of the Wolf Guard, is $3 on drive through RPG, so it's not free. Asylum, uh, issue number one, isn't actually even out yet, but I'll put a link to the uh, the webpage where you can find out more inform information about it. It's It was uh, kickstarted. Issues number one and two were kickstarted. I'm sure they'll eventually be released, but I'll put links to them. The third one, Black Marsh, is totally free in PDF form. You can buy the physical book, but uh, but the PDF is free on drive through RPG. So again, I'll put links below to where you can get all of them. Let's start out with Tales of the Wolf Guard. This is by the creator of the uh, of Fallcrest Abbey, which I've reviewed before. It's a fantastic adventure. I love Fallcrest Abbey. Um, I, I you know have nothing but praise for it. And this is very similar in that it's high quality, but it's a very different kind of setting than than Fallcrest Abbey is. Um, the artwork is fantastic throughout all of these books, but especially this this one I like a lot. It's it's odd. Now, if you're worried about the uh, the uh, the color, as you'll see. Uh, it's not necessarily going to be something you're going to easily print out in this form. Um, but I think there's a... Uh, a, a um, in fact, I, I, I'm very certain that there is a uh, print-friendly version, so you can get that. Uh, the very interesting uh, introduction, everything's hyperlinked, which is great. You get an introduction, and the layout of the introduction is fantastic. You start off with, what will you find in this book, and the truths of the setting. This is sort of stuff that kind of has to go along with the, the game, and it says feel free to tweak or ignore them to make the, the, the particular region fit with your campaign, but you're going to have to change more than just these assumptions if you change these assumptions, because they kind of influence the whole, the whole product. But you, you can do it, certainly. Um, and what will you find in this book? I like that stuff a lot. Oh yeah, that's right, it also comes with an ambient soundtrack. <laughs> so you also have a soundtrack to play while you're doing your games, which is really cool. More and more uh, people are doing that in their productions, and I think that's fun. You get Blizzard Vale, and what it is, it's a frozen, hostile land with sparse patches of conifers, icy rivers, and lakes. So you have this sort of frozen north, where it's the northernmost province of the Empire. You can kind of think Skyrim. <laughs> and it's definitely a place of adventure. It's a place of danger and a place of weirdness. There's a lot of cool stuff going on here. Um, the Dakas, which are these... Uh, I think that's how you say it, Dakas. It's the uh, mounts and draft animals. I kind of think Chocobos. Large, bird-like, but flightless animals. It definitely feels like they're influenced by Chocobos. But they have like these crystalline structures attached to them. It's kind of an interesting variation. Um, Isvinder is the main town that you're looking at, uh, and uh, it's, it's where things are going on. Are there these really cool Siaris? I think Siars? I don't know how to say it. Siars, probably. It's really cool. They're these, like, arcane eyes that lets you kind of um, uh, connect to other places. And you can communicate with, with other ones that are distant, and so it's a little bit like, you know, these beacons that go from place to place to place. It's a cool idea. Um, places of interest in Yisvinder? Yes, 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 Yisvinder? 
the Legate's Palace, the Inns and Taverns there. You have the Thrill of Gambling, so a different kind of game. Here are your rules for The Last Stand, which is a, uh, a game your players can, can play at the taverns here. Yisvinder's Last Guardian. Um, there's an ice golem here. Uh, that's really cool. The Houses of Pleasure, General Store, the Temple of the First Mother. So you can get, again, a sense of the, the local area. And it has, a, again, a particular, a particular tone that you're looking at here. A town built upon a secret. There is a secret here that the town is kept warm and alive by the fury of a fire demon that is beneath the earth. But it is very slowly dying, and so the town is getting colder and colder. That's really interesting. There's a demon there, so if you defeat it and destroy it, well, then the town freezes. If you just leave it alone, the town freezes. So how do you... But you've also trapped a demon down there, so it's a kind of a dangerous, you know, rock-in-a-hard-place situation. It's a cool, longer-term secret for the campaign, for your hometown. It doesn't have to start off as a danger, but... Maybe slowly over the campaign, it does. There's a winter carnival, a typical dishes. You get elk jerky, frostberry stew, glacial trout pie, icicle mint tea, and spice bread. Some really cool ideas there. The scorpion milk sect uh, cult there, and their misdeeds in town, a table for their misdeeds. And you get some of the things, the barbarian elves with their savage mores, um, the sacrifices that they make, settlements and worm writing. So it's very much out of Dune, although you're talking about quartz worms, so they're like, you know, snow worms instead of... Um, instead of sandworms. Five clans of them, barbarian markets, with the items that you can find, and some really cool ones. The Icarius, or Icarius, um, they're bird men, sort of. Sort of like Icarus, I suppose, is kind of the influence there. The Icarius, really cool creatures. Really cool creatures, um, and there's some more information about them in this book. There's the, the typical Icarian house. They're kind of aliens who settled here. You could change that, obviously, in your own setting, but that's the idea, is that they had these these ships that came down with eldritch, eldritch magic and science. And they combined them and sailed the stars, and they crashed here, and now they're stuck here, and they've been stuck here for a long, long time, but they uh, they are you know now just mostly kind of settled into the world, and they have cool things like light lances, which are you know, non-lethal weapons and things like that. That's really, really cool, and they have their own technology. Great piece of art there, very cool. The Wolf Guard is basically what you're sort of assumed to be a part of. The Wolf Guard are these, well, they um, they protect the frontier um, and they defend the city. And basically, it started off as a penal colony, as like prisoners, but they fought against the the uh, barbarians when they came to destroy them, and then they kind of became this special garrison. So now you can kind of join into the Wolf Guard and be be an adventurer who goes around trying to solve it. And probably that would be how you play the setting, as you're part of the Wolf Guard. And then there are dens and places that they have set up around the... There's an organizational system and places that they have set up. Here's a typical den that you might run into from the Wolf Guard with the room descriptions and things like that. Um, and how to upgrade it, which is really cool. So you can basically invest a certain amount of XP and level up your den and make it stronger. And you get stronger as you go through. It's a really cool idea for a longer term setting or sort of a sandbox where you're returning to your home base over and over. I think that's kind of cool. There are some ruins and some dungeons here, uh, Urizen, and some lots of different dungeons you can run into across the face of the area that are created for you. Really briefly, and you're not giving a, lot, giving a lot of detail for these places. Some notable NPCs, monsters, and some extra stuff for the setting. A table of legends and rumors, and a quest plot generator. This is kind of cool. It's a very simple one, D4s and D3s, but it gives you what you need to develop adventures out here in the frozen wastes of the north. Of the world. And then you get an actual adventure, the Windswept Pass, which is an introduction to the veil and to the cultures and to the setting and kind of the tone of what you're going to be playing. So it's a great thing. It's set out in scenes, so you're kind of doing this and then that and then this other. And then uh, you, you go through the dungeon at the very end, and that's it. Here's a side map of the Blizzard Veil. You can kind of turn your head and see it. But it's, it's a cool one. I really like the way it's laid out. Very simple. It's a big valley because you're talking about uh, five-mile hexes, and so this is quite large. Um, this is a big setting. You'd want to fill it in with a lot of your own stuff, especially if you were doing like a hex crawl. You'd want to fill this in with a lot of extra things, like random tables for encounters, which are not in this book, and things like that. This is definitely a setting book, first and foremost, but it's a really cool one. Tanar, which is an, a, a certain kind of chess game. You can play a chess game, a chess board. Uh, and then there's a journal for your characters, your players, I should say. And that's it. Tales of the Wolf Guard, designed for old use with old school essentials. This is a fantastic book. Really great setting. I think you'd have a lot of fun playing in in this particular Frozen Veil. Vale. Uh, I, I 
if you're interested in running kind of a more you know harsh uh, frozen wilderness campaign especially if you're kind of doing a more open table then something like tales of the wolf guard would be awesome because you could have everyone is just a member of the wolf guard and then they come and go in particular missions and they pop in and drop out and you could just have like a you know a, a sort of unfolding adventure defending the veil from the various threats and exploring the secrets below it and stuff like that so fantastic setting highly recommend checking this one out the second one is the spike of dosku which is the first issue as i said of Asylum, which is a uh, a new world uh, setting for DCC. Um, it's compatible with DCC. You could obviously run it anywhere else, but if, as you'll see running through the adventure, it's a funnel, and so it, it sort of assumes a level zero party, and it also has some assumptions about statistics and mechanics and things for DCC, so you're really definitely looking at a particular, a particular game, but you could adapt it easily enough. Great art throughout. I love this. The idea is your well the world is really interesting but the idea of the adventure is that you're in a village it's attacked you have to flee and uh, someone says hey here's a, a an old hidden ruin that i know of i used to live here ages ago uh hide in there that you can find a way out i promise and then they die and so you have to go in there's an army outside you can't leave and so you have to find your way to the portal at the very end and so you have to run through this dungeon and it's it's fairly linear there are a handful of choices about left and right and things like that maybe one or two ways to skip a section or one or two, you know, if you find the secret door in four, for example, it can skip you right to the hallway uh, below and you can skip from six and 11. But for the most part, you're going room to room to room and kind of experiencing what that is. And very often it's deadly and going to kill a, play, a character or two as this is a funnel. Um, great author's note with thanks and playtesters and credits and all that stuff. Table of contents, which is not hyperlinked, but it's a short PDF. This one's only 25 pages um, in spread form. This is the map of the setting. It's a great map. I really, really like it. And it's it has a lot of really flavorful names, flavorful ideas. And you're, um, you know, you're not given information about a lot of this. Uh, the, in the zines that are going to come out in the future, I assume more and more of these things are going to be detailed. In fact, that's, that's what's stated. But for now, you just get a very flavorful map. Uh, and I, I, I just like a lot of the details here. It's, it's, it's evocative. So if you just had this map, you would you could take it and you could develop a lot of information about it. And I think that'd be really cool. You're, you start off in the town of Hearth, which is right here. And you can see that there are two walls to the north and west and then a big wall to the south. And basically you're in like a neutral zone between these two nations. Um, and uh, that's where the, the battle takes place is over. You know, they, they, they start fighting over your town or they start marching past it and they start destroying uh, it in the process. And so you're kind of trying to escape there. A brief history of the world, Asylum, and the three powers. There are these really interesting ideas of these wizards, these druidic wizards, who uh, were rising in power, and the queen of one of the kingdoms really was uh, you know, afraid of them, and so she purged them all, and so they're, 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 they call them the spikes, which are these basically places going down into the earth that were like refuges and, refuge, yeah, refuges and schools and uh, things like that. And they were almost all completely wiped out, except for the one here in Hearth, which is still intact, or was intact. You know, the people went in and destroyed it, but it's not, it's still there, and, and you can go through it. And uh, that's, that's where you're going through, that's the dungeon. And then there was a rebellion against her, and she was overthrown, so now you have all this other stuff. Uh, there's character creation in this particular world, and the changes that are made for this particular world, as well as how this particular world deals with things like wizards, clerics, and druids. Um, and then also the new uh, occupations that you can connect to this world, and then the three new races. The, the slate are kind of like rock elves or like stone elves or something like that. They're taller and thinner, and they have these sort of like rocky uh, f features and appearance, stone skin, and they have higher AC, and they have uh, lightning charges and things. So they're kind of an interesting new race class uh, in this game. I like them. I think they're pretty fun. And one thing that's interesting is the name slate sounds like slang, and gravel is the language, is the human slang for the slate language. Um, it's interesting that we're not given another name for their, for them other than slate. At least I didn't see it. Um, they are given a specific actual racial name, and then you know slate sounds like again like what a human might call them, or something like that. So, but anyway, it's it, they're really cool. I like them a lot. I think they're a fantastic race class. You get the Icarans, who are like bat folk. <laughs> Three and a half feet tall, weigh between 60 and 90 pounds, variations on the halfling sort of, you know, bat folk. Um, they get extra backstabs and hides and sneak silently, so they're kind of like halflings, but they get their own thing. And then you get the lorps, which are kind of like forest gnomes. They're really, really indulgent, and they eat, like eat and drink and do lots of crazy stuff, and they have connections to nature magic, and they can explode. If they get too much magic, they can explode into trees and become trees and stuff. So it's very interesting, um, lorps. 
interesting race class. So all three of them, I think, are, are fun additions to the game. And as you can see, the art throughout is great, fantastic, and it's in-world art, so it's not just generic. You get, like, the actual creatures here um, and shown forth. You get the Spike of Dosku, which is the map, the adventure. I wish the map were recreated on multiple pages that you only get it at the front and then here, but it's fine. It's not too complicated. You can kind of flip back and forth pretty quickly with some notes about how to play it and if you want to avoid some instant death traps and things like that and how to use luck, maybe... Players start, there's a lot of box text that you're going to be reading and a lot of sort of railroading initially, but that's fine. It, you know, it's like, here, come with me, come with me, and then the version dies off, you know, kind of on screen, but automatically. And, but that's fine for an introductory, especially for a DCC funnel, when you have a bunch of care players, or a bunch of characters with a few players, it makes sense. I, I don't mind that. Um, the adventure's really cool. There's lots of fun stuff to interact with, lots of fun tricks to find. You know, you're dealing with uh, uh, drunken gargoyles and pet giant spiders and horrible thistle creature that appears every seven minutes or can appear every seven minutes or something like that. Or he, he, you can make him, you can create him, he's sort of like a, a practice dummy for the old school, but he dies after seven minutes, kind of horrifyingly. Um, there's a soup golem, a soup construct you have to fight. Uh, you're going through a wizard school, kind of, or like a druid wizard school. It's kind of an interesting variation on just the, the wizard school. And there's a lot of stuff to find. There's a giant potted plant monster. And then you get to the very end and there's a, a walking door. You can walk through it and you, you should uh, pop out somewhere else in the world. And that kind of leads right into what will be the second issue of Silent, which I assume will have another adventure, but also more world building and more information about the, the setting. So you have Silent, the Broken Heart of Chelra, which is the setting, and the, the extra classes in the adventure. So it's a fantastic little setting book. Uh, I highly recommend it when it comes out. You know, I, I backed it on Kickstarter and um, I'm, I'm very happy that I did. I think both issue number one and two are going to be great. So keep an eye out for it. I'll put a link to where you can you know, go to the page and maybe get, get notified when it comes out. Cool little setting, great adventure. Okay, the last one I wanted to cover in this video is Black Marsh. Uh, this is a setting supplement compatible with swords and wizardry, it's rules and all editions based on the original 1974 role-playing game. Absolutely. This feels just like a recreation, or not a recreation, but like a, a loving tribute to and a, and a cousin of something like Blackmore, right? The old, old setting. Um, one of the first settings for TND, in fact. And I think that's sort of what the idea is. This is old school world building with that tone. And I think that if you really like, um, if you're really in, in the mood for an old school, I mean, 1974, uh, old school world, this has been designed to be just like that with the same sort of ideas and information. There's a lot of great art throughout this book too. But you have a setting with, you know, you know, humans, elves, dwarves, and halflings, you've got a lot of stuff packed into a very, well, not very small, but a small-ish region, and, and stuff that goes all the way from kobolds all the way up to red dragons and their, their lairs. So you've got a huge full campaign setting here that could you could run for years if you wanted to. Everything is briefly described, and not a lot is given um, in terms of information beyond that. So dungeons aren't detailed, although they're referenced and, and they're, they're talked about and mentioned. And said, you know, like, like, there's a dungeon here, basically. But, and, and maybe a few in, bits of information are given about it. But up, other than that, it's up to you to develop. So this is going to be a lot of work for you to flesh out your campaign. But this is a really good um, beginning, right? You get, as it says, most locales are meant to serve as a springboard for the referee to create his own details. Absolutely. That's exactly what you get here. Um... Now, this is this came out originally in 2010. This is a reformat edition. I think this is version 12 is the one that you can download now. So there's been a lot of editions or modifications of this. As I said, this is free in PDF form. You can buy the book, uh, but it's free in PDF form. It's only 39 pages, so it's it's not that long. It's not that big. So, a, a, I mean, a free PDF is awesome. And the artwork is fantastic. I love it. It's very evocative. It draws you right into the kind of world you're looking into. And some advice for how to run this game the overview of the of the region and and some major events that have happened there you have the the shattering the mountain that fell <laughs> and you have a bunch of islands now in this bay that's been created by probably a meteor or something like that you have some additional uh, information about coinage and viz which is a magical substance basically it lets you cast spells without losing your spells kind of an interesting idea for wizards and then you have the, the bordering places what connects to it the north uh, wild north the southland and then adaptation notes if you wanted to put this into its own setting. Now it sounds like it's designed to work with a particular product, uh, the Lands of Adventure from Goodman Games, or earlier Points of Light from Goodman Games. But you can set it 
wherever you want with just some information about what's expected. You know, like there are these dwarves that come from this place. And you could just change it to your own dwarven kingdom or here are the, ref the ideas behind the races and they're, you know, how they would connect to other homelands in your world and things like that. There's a group of Dark Elves, essentially, who you could just use, you know, Dark Elves from other games if you wanted the House of the Raven here. And then a brief rundown of the geography of this place. Uh, really cool basic idea, information, really cool basic information. Is it just enough to get you into the geography of where things are? There is a map at the very end, and you get a map as a separate file. I'll go through that when, you, when we get to it, though. Um, just again, that a very evocative imagery. You're, uh, at least for me, this draws me right into each of those places. I want, to, I want my players to explore it. I want to explore it, just by looking at the, the pieces of art that were given. Great ones. Really great pieces of art. D20 table for rumors, it's just a place to get started, right? A really simple place to get started. And one of the things that I do like about the even the false rumors here is that they connect to things that actually are in the world. So for example, here's one of them. Uh, rumor 11 is, three beautiful maidens dwell in the westernmost lake of the Black Marshes. They will bestow their treasure on those who please them. False. Well, there are three naiads there and they do compete with each other and might even reward those who help them but they're not just like nice beautiful maidens who want people to please them like they want to capture them and keep them and they want to they're, they're naiads they're, they're tricksy and stuff and so it's kind of true there's a especially for like a hex crawl if you started with this you'd be like well we could go investigate that and see what it is the fact that it's false there isn't just a straight up false rumor it draws you to a particular location where there's something interesting that relates to the rumor <laughs> and it's even quasi true to some degree so i think that those sorts of false rumors totally fine with i like that um some of them are, are a little less true <laughs> like that some of them are a little less helpful but for the most part they're great rumors and again just as an indication of what to do to get started in this setting and then you get a breakdown of the different hex uh, hexes where interesting things are happening and it's chock full as i said this, this pdf is 39 pages most of them are descriptions of hexes and just rundowns of what's there in a very brief way. So, 0107, a band of brigands are bent on vengeance against the rangers of Black Marsh and are marching on Black Cloak Castle. Sigrun the Boneless, a fighter level 9, two captains, fighter level 6 and 5, and three lieutenants, fighter level 4, lead 115 brigands. That's, if you run into that, okay, that started a new whole quest line. Do you run away? Do you help the rangers of Black Marsh? Do you, do you go to Black Cloak Castle to warn them, Black Oak Castle to warn them and, and fight in a siege there? <laughs> what do you do? That would be an interesting quest because I don't imagine you just go and attack 115 brigands straight up. But maybe you do guerrilla tactics and, you know, harassment as they go there and then, you know, who knows what you do. But it could be a fun um, beginning to a, to a whole adventure arc. Then you get 0214, a mother black dragon, old, hit dice 8, and her child, young, hit dice 7, have slaughtered a herd of deer and are in a meadow consuming the carcasses. Okay, I mean, you could definitely ignore that. Like, we don't want to deal with these dragons. Or maybe you follow them back to their lair. Or maybe you just try to kill them straight up. Or maybe you try to negotiate with them. Maybe you need them for help somewhere else. And again, like, these ideas are very simple. Or I shouldn't say they're simple. Like, sometimes they're complex and interconnected. But what I mean is they're very, you don't get very much information. You get a little bit, just enough to get you thinking. And then you have to create the rest. This That's this whole setting. And I really like what is presented. It is, it's... Old school, 1974, so you're dealing with, you know, <laughs> evil dark elves, and you're dealing with black dragons and red dragons, and orcs attacking a keep, and kobold tribes harassing people, and nixies and naiads causing trouble, and, you know, you get the, you get the point. Evil, you know, sorceresses on an island who enchant men who come onto it but let the women go, or, like, you're dealing with classic tropes and archetypes of the D&D game, and they're presented in a very simple way so that you can easily adapt them to your own preference, your own choice with a lot of cool uh, indications of where dungeons might be and some factions. Really great. Well, Black Oak Blast is such a, such a great piece of art for Black Oak Castle. I love that. It makes me want to go there. It makes me want to, again, just spend time there. I, my mind went crazy with, like, as soon as I saw that piece of art, I was like, oh, man. Okay, so this is the ranger headquarters. Oh, awesome. So it might be overgrown here. Maybe it's hidden there. Maybe there's this way to get in. Maybe there's something going on with the, you know, a false ranger or a lost ranger or... Maybe they're dying out. Who knows? Like, you know, whatever you want to do. You have a whole uh, faction headquarters and a great piece of evocative art there with some descriptions of the captain and, and what's going on there. Really fantastic. Just absolutely cool. <laughs> There's a magic school there, so if you have a magic user and they need to be trained to pass a certain point, maybe they have to go to Black Oak Castle. Maybe the same thing with a thief. Um, you have to go there. And maybe if someone is a ranger, they certainly have to go there or want to connect there. Or maybe... 
once you, if you're doing like an open table, maybe once you connect to Black Oak Castle and do something for them, maybe you can start with rangers, right? Ranger characters or something like that. That'd be kind of cool. Uh, or you could just have the player start off connected to it. There's no initial adventure given. There's no even adv initial advice or anything like that. You're just given this region. Um, so it's a lot of freedom for you, which I love. Settings like this where it's like, hey, here's a bunch of cool stuff. Here's a bunch of cool ideas that I had speaking in, as the DM, or speaking as the creator, here's a bunch of cool ideas that I've had, and you, you have them now. <laughs> and go and make them your own and do fun things with them. That's so cool. It's one of the best parts of our hobby. I love it. <laughs> Just people who put out stuff for free, and they're like, hey, this is cool. Have fun. And that's what this is. It's so, so cool. Great pieces of art here, too. Um, now, eventually, you do get a, a more detailed location, and that's Castle uh, Black Marsh itself which is a, sort of a town and, you know, the castle. And there is indication that there are dungeons beneath the castle. In fact, there are a many-level dungeon beneath Castle Black Marsh. But um, it's not very detailed very highly. Now, there's a Temple of Toth and a Temple of Thor, but again, you can easily change those out if you want a different, different gods in your system. It's interesting that the Temple of Toth, you could connect that easily to Arden Vul. Um, I think so. <laughs> the Viz Club. Emporium of the Strange and Arcane, the Company of Honorable Men, and then some pieces of art to indicate what might be below the castle. So sewer entrance to the upper storerooms with yellow mold hanging from the ceiling, Castle Black Marsh Dungeons. The Emporium of the Strange and Arcane, Black Castle Black Marsh. Just so good. And then some more locales as you go through. Uh, let's read through one. 1309. The larger island is all that remains of the mountain that fell. It is incredibly rich in viz, although the lack of any beach and the steep slopes make it difficult to get around. Any who manage to brave the island not only has to contend with the ire of the Wizard of the Isle, but the numerous flyers dwelling upon the slopes. There have been reports of gargoyles, wyverns, griffins, hippogriffs, pegasi, chimerae, manticores, and even rocks nesting near the summit. The smaller island off the southwest shore is home to the mysterious Wizard of the Isle, a magic user level 18. His presence goes back centuries, and all anybody knows of him is that he is the self-appointed guardian of what remains of the mountain that fell. Anybody surviving landfall and subsequent attacks by the local creatures will be apprehended by the Wizard of the Isle and warned not to return. They will be escorted back to their ship by the wizard's golden mechanical servant, C3. <laughs> right, C3PO. He will calmly explain that they need to seek their viz elsewhere and that the mountain that fell is very dangerous to meddle with. And that's it. That's all you're given. So there could be tons of dungeons there. There could be tons of stuff to explain. Maybe there's something buried inside the mountain that fell. Perhaps something that's creating the viz and the wizard is trying to protect it or you know, keep it from waking up. Who knows? Great introduction to a whole campaign arc there. These magic users are 18, so it's probably going to be pretty high level unless the players have to try to find a way to sneak past him or maybe he goes missing and something starts to happen. Who knows? Tons of cool stuff you could do there. Maybe his home, which is a great piece of art there, is a dungeon itself. I would imagine it is. There's Jorvik, and there's the sort of Viking cultures that are settling here too. Um, Norbury Castle, Sir Dennis Langer. Uh, served on the frontier with the Grand Kingdom's rival. Yeah, it's a great world. A great, great world building in the background, too. Some were tigers. There's a bunch of rocks up in 1706. Uh, 158 elves in residence along with 200 slaves, mostly orcs, uh, with the Brotherhood of the Raven. In 2105, there's a lair of Scytheback, a very old red dragon, and her mate, and two of her three young. One has gone missing. See 1706. Fantastic. Fantastic ideas. The tribute place. This is where you give tribute. Um, this crude heap of stone serves as a keep for Kinkaris, who's a fighter of seven orc, and his guards. He's been placed in charge of collecting the annual tribute for the Brotherhood of the Ravens from the Bat Eaters and the Blood Crusher tribes. There's some mermaids, as you might uh, hope for. There's a ruined castle. Within the ruined castle, made of black stone, are twisted skeletal remains. It is obvious they can be some horrific end. Several attempts over the last fifth, several centuries have been made to reoccupy the castle in 2201. Nevertheless, after the full moon, the new inhabitants are slain in the same manner. The last attempt was made a couple hundred, was hundred years ago by the Brotherhood of the Raven. So there's just a cool, cursed castle here that you can go and explore and find out what's going on and how they die every full moon. Castle Taldane, King Ragnar the Ringless. It's kind of a cool name. And a great piece of art for his castle, which goes out over these... Three fangs, these three spikes coming up out of the water. That's super cool. Uh, definitely stuff you could run into there. Uh, Costbera of Vasin Cirrus, in exchange for food and supplies, she will build a fire out of driftwood and seawood to read the omens for the giver. And then here's the map of the bay, which you have the western portion of it and then the eastern portion of it. Uh, very, very clear, very well laid out. 
Super old school, I love it. Some equipment price listing at the very end, and then the OG open gaming license and all that stuff. So Black Marsh, highly recommend this one. Again, since it's free, you would be, <laughs> you would be well advised to go just check it out right away. Well guys, I hope this has been an interesting video and I'll see you all in another one.